Simon Hicks. Um, I went to an event recently by Siemens called Investor Ready Cities. And the basic conclusion was that cities which attract investment are cities where people want to live. Um, so I was just wondering, a kind of question really directed at Marcus, but ties into all of this, um, this morning's presentations. Um, does, does, uh, does making our cities healthy and attractive for people to live off, also offer economic benefits in, in regards to attracting kind of businesses and investment into cities? Well, I think definitely. I mean, if, this, if this, the city needs to be a place where people want to live, want to ha have their families, want to grow up in, grow old in, um, I think there's a combination between that and, of course, I mean, the biggest determinant um, for the WHO in health is employment. But it's the nature of the employment, because if you attract in investment and the jobs are a long way to commute to, you know, commuting is, is, has huge stress implications on families and on, on mental health. Um, if the job is low paid or temporary or zero hours, then, then what, sort of, so it's what sort of investment, really? If it's the right sort of investment and the right sort of offer, the whole package, I mean, it's unassailable. Herbert, did you want to add anything? Okay. Not really, uh, it's okay. not my main field, but yes, it's, I think it's, it's very evident from cities that have uh, improved the ambience and, and the way Freiburg has done that it's become a, an imme immensely attractive place. I know the same thing is true of Curitiba in Brazil, a city that has a beautiful ambience uh, across much of the city, which has become a major location for very successful businesses. Ironically, actually, the car industry in particular. <laughs> we have a question uh, right at the back. Uh, yeah, just just joining all three together, those those, those great speeches, um, is the issue of children, the issue of well-being. And uh, I was assured by a senior a senior uh, practitioner from Scotland that the biggest impact on children from poor families' well-being was education. And I just wondered about. You, know, we, you haven't bridged into that, any of the three of you, but this, this issue about poor families and children and giving them hope and, and well-being, how do you relate to that in this? Well, <laughs> it's, you know, it's a, education is on there in terms of the, the health map. It's a determinant of health. But you can't... Because it's a system, you have, you, you have to fire it on all cylinders. You can't educate something. You know, if, I'm not sure if it's education for just better prospects in life or it's education around health uh, and healthy lifestyles. Of course, education is really important, but you can't educate people to uh, know how to cook and, and have good food and know about exercise if you're placing them in an environment where those things are continually, those lifestyle choices, if you like, continually frustrated. So I, th I think it's important as both. And I think the, the big win-win is, is, is having the schools, I suppose it's the, it's the nature of the schools understanding that and eking out health back into the neighbourhoods, and that, you know, so that the partnerships between the sustainable maybe food um, enterprises, initiatives out in the community into the schools. So you've got sort of links, all the nature conservation, so, that, so the school needs to be embedded in that philosophy of a sustainable or healthy neighbourhood. It's the t again, the type of education, how that works. I think it's particularly important to think about giving deprived children access to nature because the you know, problems of bad diet and problems of uh, air pollution and, and all the problems that bad neighbourhoods of, of often repre represent can really be tackled to some extent at least by giving children a chance to not only see green around them, but actually become involved in urban gardening. I mean, for instance, there's a lot of examples around the world of the revival of urban agriculture, which uh, in part allows children to get access to, to, to food growing opportunities, not only in schools, which is beginning to happen in the UK now, but beyond that, uh, you know, becoming really uh, getting an understanding of how they relate to nature in terms of the, the food that they, they consume on a daily basis, that ha half the time they haven't got a clue of where it comes from. So I think that's a really important part of the story. Okay, I'm afraid we're going to have to finish there. T just uh, one quick reminder, the, the afternoon session, the workshops begin with us together in plenary here before we break off into the group. So just re we'll turn here and uh, we'll try to get back on track and resume at uh, around quarter two. Um, 
But before you leave, I, I hope you'll agree that's been an outstanding set of uh, presentations with just any number of ideas for us to be uh, mulling over and exploring as the day uh, proceeds. So can I ask you all please to join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you.